So, as we, as we saw with Dr. Nash's lecture and John's lecture, that there are quite a lot of lenses or whales of distortion between a dead animal and what you think of it hundreds of millions of years later. And I, want, I wanted to show what we think of this. I mean, one of our key ideas behind our book was that the image of dinosaurs we have in popular culture and even in scientific understanding is more or less a construct. Now, don't be scared because words like construct, image, they are the kind of words that cultural relativists use and heavens no, I'm not saying nothing like that. There are of course many, many wrong ways to reconstruct an animal and we saw many of these. But I just want to, we just feel that there is no right set in stone way either. Something about, some things about the past we will never get to know. They will not only be unknowns, but they will be unknownable unknowns. You will never get to see them. And one of the paradigm shifts paleo art could benefit from is, could be accepting this. We would never know some things. Because we have gaps in this, between these lenses of distortion, and we have to plug them in with educated guesswork. And we shouldn't have to pretend that our educated guesswork is anything but that. So what are these lenses of distortion? Here's a very corporate looking slide about uh, just my idea of how they might be. There might be more among these, other researchers can contribute. So it starts with death, fossilization, fossil reconstruction, artistic interpretation and our popular understanding. There are also scientific consensus and popular culture that keep affecting each other and each of the whales along the way along the way. So let's start with death and preservation. Animals don't just die like that. Uh, I mean, when they're dead, things happen to their body. So this was one of the more popular, even before fossilization starts, you can get really weird monsters and things. Uh, a lot of you might know this is the Montauk monster, debunked mainly by Dr. Nash here, that this weird eagle-headed pot-bellied imp found washed ashore on the beach is actually a raccoon. So, looking, back, looking at fossils, are we really sure that those quills were just on the tail? And what happened to the body? Was there anything on the face that's now not in the fossil? This, coincidentally, is one of the best preserved soft tissue fossils of rather large dinosaurs. So you have to keep this in mind even when looking at the fossil. Now, what you do after looking at the fossil? As, as Dr. Nash and John just told you... Oh, 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 wait, wait, I got confused. Before that, there's also fossilization. Now, you got the dead animal, it turns into a fossil, so things get lost on the way. And then you get mystifying bits and pieces. And actually, it's my private opinion that playing around with these is almost as fun as going very real and trying to find out the real reconstruction. This is Dinocherius, the terrible arms dinosaur. It's got arms wide enough to clutch a WWW beetle and fingers possibly as long as my forearm here. There's even a more badass mystery claw dinosaur called Pterisnosaurus. One of its claws was possibly as long as my leg right here. So with this uh, missing bits of fossils, people try to make educated guesses and make them sound like you know, they know about them, but you get some very funny interpretations. The Dinocherius was interpreted as a giant sloth dinosaur, or an enormous Freddy Krueger theropod that swipes <laughs> aside uh, sauropods, big, big, big plant-eating dinosaurs' bellies, it ripped them open. Or, it has been, now that more complete remains are known, we think it's a big ostrich dinosaur, but even that is in dispute. Maybe it had different body proportions. Also, you have to watch out with fossils about fossil distortion. You certainly can't take this fossil at face value. It would look like, well, a doofus. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sahelanthropus. It's squashed up beyond recognition. And take notice that it's a very recent fossil. Uh, I mean, geological strata do funny things to fossils. You spend millions of years being compacted by the weight of continents. So 
you have to expect that some things have been distorted. Then, of course, looking at the fossils and the skeletons, you make a skeleton reconstruction, but you have to remember that this one, these are also made by people, some very educated and very able people, of course, but they change throughout the ages. Um, Diplodocus, as Dr. Nash showed us, started out more lizardy, museum reconstructions reflected that, and now we have a more dynamic, active uh, skeletal reconstruction going around. Of course, there can be some very differently weird ones. Initially, these were this particular dinosaur was reconstructed as a you know very weird fat lizard the size of a bus just shuffling about. <laughs> and I mean, one of our thinking behind all yesterday is that you can have fun with these reconstructions. You can draw them and imagine them as if they were real and. You know they're not real, but this kind of thinking gives your mind a certain bit of uh, speculative freedom. We'll see more about that. Of course, some, sometimes skeletal reconstruction uh, goes to very strange places. This is doctor, not doctor, but researcher, David Peters. <laughs> I, mean, I feel a little bad when I'm eliciting all this laughter because I think David Peters is a great artist and a great speculator and I mean I don't agree with his reconstructions online he thought maybe we were making fun of him but personally I have great respect for the guy his books are awesome this is not right but I respect <laughs> him so uh, one of the things Dr. Peter, Mr. Peters does is that he thinks squashed up features are real and then he uses a technique called what? Photoshop. Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> he basically uh, clarifies an image on digital imaging software and try, uh, thinks he has seen features that no other researcher can see. Once again this is completely false but it gives us new perspective of, of looking at it even if they might be false ones. As you can see, up there is the real fossil, and this is what uh, Dr. Peters, in, Mr. Peters, interprets of the bit. The thing with this is, maybe someone should make a drawing of this animal with the things that we don't know left out, only the front half, and this has been done. Uh, the quest to achieve, to grip reality with such fragmentary things, sometimes gets you to weird and bad places. <laughs> And then, of course, after the reconstruction is done, you have the artist's interpretation. We, Dr. Nash showed a lot of these examples, so I'm going to be brief on this, this step, but um, we can say that which one is the real triceratops. Then you could have maybe, in the future, they will have a newer interpretation. Maybe they will have a furry one, something like with the mane of a lion, and then they will say which one is the real one. The thing is, we, will, we may never get to know and we better get used to this. So, there's also factors beyond science. As I told you, this is about dead animal and how people see that dead animal. And we might know that there are scientific <coughs> consensus that some, sometimes grips advanced thoughts in their step. And people are afraid to be bold, so they stop. And then there's also popular culture which influences the great majority of people who don't and will never get to be scientific about past animals. And we have to accept that too and live with that. Here's popular culture. Personally, um, I got an ambiguous approach. I mean, the reconstructions in these movies and shows personally make me cringe. But they're actually a useful stepping stone. A kid growing up with, on that Barney the dinosaur has a greater chance of being scientifically interested in dinosaurs. That was the case with me and I guess many of you in this room with Jurassic Park. And then there's of course the established scientific consensus. I don't mean to address this in a bad way. Usually the consensus is a consensus because it's right. But sometimes um, it's too, it feels too complacent, too right. This should be interacted with, not in a V for Vendetta style, but, you know, in an in a intelligent discourse, you should always question things. And then we get to the end of the matter. Why does all this matter? 
Uh, I get personally, I get this question a lot because I make my life in large parts uh, in a profession that has nothing to do with paleontology. They say, why are you drawing the dinosaurs? Fuck, what does this matter? And I will tell them, <coughs> why, why does it matter? It matters because of this. First, it's a demystification of the past. Animals are not monsters. The past was not some sort of movie. Animals did things just as they do things now on, main, on, on the main dimensions. You have to really, this, people take this so much for granted. I think it comes down to like a public understanding of the past as something weird and beyond their care. But once you look at the past in, in a real way, then you feel connections to it in a real way. And then also this reminds us that science is a critical process. You're not doing science if you're not making mistakes. And I think researchers should be, should be more comfortable with having their assumptions torn apart. They should even be happy with them. And they should even ridicule this. They sh you should be able to make a wonky dinosaur reconstruction just because it's cool or it's because it's thought provoking. And then, in the end, beyond dinosaurs, okay, forget it. I mean, you may want nothing to do with dinosaurs, and that's really cool. But this gives us a very useful thinking tool, logical speculation. When you, when you aim for a general picture, but you do it without owning up a certain solution, without being, you know, so tight in the ass about it, it gives you a certain freedom, a certain leeway in which you can actually fit many answers that can be right later on. And this is useful, useful outside paleontology. History can benefit from it, biology can benefit from it, cultural studies, I hate them, but they can benefit from it. <laughs> Things like conflict resolution or even your daily outlook in life can benefit from it. I think in the end, mm, you have to assume that you can make stuff up to fill in the blanks and it's perfectly okay to be wrong. Heck, it's even cool to be wrong. But you just have to keep up in one corner of your mind that what you make up is made up. And now in this day and age, the game, I think, is not as much about getting right or being right, but it's more about getting people to think, influencing, to, influencing people to think in new ways, in creative ways, in wrong ways and then contributing to the overall discussion and discourse of the way we try to imagine things. So, thank you very much with my drawing from all yesterdays. I hope you enjoyed our se selection of lectures. They're all being recorded, they will be online soon, you will hear of them. And thank you for being here. Now let's drink wine, buy books, socialize and make merry. Thank you.